issue with the Well, that's the thing, I don't know. <laughs> I can't piece out of turn on that. Pizza piano. Okay. The intern. Turn off your speaker. Did I start down? Yeah. Oh, I didn't do that. Because I, I can't see it right now. Okay. Alright. I guess I have to start it again. I mean, if you didn't hear anything, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's just us and John. Okay, well, that's good to have somebody else, so we don't have to go through this another hour. Okay. You want to start re-recording then, or do you want me to cut? We can cut the first part off. Okay, all right, sounds good. All right, sorry about that. Welcome to our Meraki webinar in the Summer 2015 series. My name is Diane Dunlap, and I'm going to talk about wireless monitoring today, specifically of Meraki equipment. My coworker Gons is also here with me. This webinar will be posted afterwards. And at the end, we will be taking questions via chat. On our agenda today, we have a discussion of what to monitor at minimum, what network services Meraki makes available for the purposes of monitoring, and monitoring available within the Meraki cloud. Then we'll discuss how Meraki equipment can be monitored via SNMP using Cacti, which is open source. In our discussion of cacti, we'll talk about how to get cacti, how to set up monitoring in cacti, how to do thresholding of statistics using cacti. So first, what to monitor? Well, at the very least, you'd want to know if the access points were up or down. That's kind of a no-brainer. And the number of devices connected to each access point is important for the purposes of determining current load as well as capacity for the future. The fact that an access point might have a lot of users on it would be good to know, but if an access point had very few users connected, that would also be good to know. For example, if no one ever connects to an access point, is the radio hardware bad? Or maybe it's located in an out-of-the-way place. A large number of devices on an access point might be okay, where user expectations haven't been set that there will be coverage. For example, the cafeteria. Has the administration told students that they would have unlimited coverage in the cafeteria if they all brought their cell phones to school? The interface load, not only of the radio, but Ethernet, would be good to know. And of course, the availability of IP addresses for users, the DHCP scope. In terms of doing up-down monitoring, this can be done via the Meraki cloud, but can also be done using any SNMP manager. You may already have an SNMP manager set up in your network, maybe something other than Cacti. And instead of looking at Meraki cloud and an SNMP manager, you might want to see this on one pane of glass. Regarding monitoring the number of devices connected to the access points, we have some information here on best practices. I've recently been studying to recertify in wireless, and the study guide suggests that 35 to 50 devices per radio will work if the users are doing web browsing and checking email. But as you can see from the table below, if you're doing web browsing and checking email uh, with this 500K to 1 meg, that is at the very low end of the spectrum, traffic-wise. If you have high-definition video streaming users, traffic utilization could be as high as 2 to 5 meg per user. The authors go on to suggest the 80% use of airtime on an access point radio is full. So if a radio were up for 10 minutes, Okay, and uh, uh, for 10 minutes, if, if it were servicing users for eight of those minutes, it would be considered full. They use an example where a number of iPads are connecting at 65 meg. So this would be like when the little icon on your laptop says you are connected at however many meg appears. Um, those would be 802.11n connections. But the usable throughput, if you're connected at 65 meg, is about half that, or 30 meg. And 
wireless, even through 802.11n, is hub technology. Only one device at a time is serviced. One can transmit and one at a time can receive. So if you were the only device in the network, you might get that 30 meg. So if you had uh, 30 meg, 80% of that would be 24 meg. And if you needed for each iPad to be using 2 meg on a radio, you could get 12 iPads on a radio. And if you had two radios, 2 times 12, you could get 24 iPads on the access point. So as you can see, there's a big difference between the 35 to 50 devices per radio and 12 devices per radio. And it's challenging to know what actually goes on in the classroom. In other words, is it a study hall where the students are actually checking email and web browsing? Or is it a situation where the teacher has all the students streaming individual high-definition videos? So we talked about the number of devices per radio and how if you had an access point with two radios, ideally you could do high-definition streaming on 12 iPads on one radio and 12 on another for 24 iPads total. But if the iPads decide not to cooperate, and instead of dividing themselves nicely between the two radios, they all glom onto one radio. <clears throat> what happens there? Well, it could happen, since roaming and deciding what AP to associate to is client dependent. We see here um, in an LEA um, where all devices decided to use the 2.4 gig radio. This was taken last fall where we were doing a site survey. And here we have 28 of 29 devices on the 2.4 gig radio. As you can see by looking at the OUIs, that would be the first six digits in this third column, and actually the fourth column, it says they're pretty much Apple devices here. And this is taken at the same LEA, same school, different room, still Apple devices. All these Apple devices decided they wanted to be on the 5 gig radio. 36 of 36 devices, all on the same radio. So we're not really picking on Apple, but this is just a point to the fact that different generations of hardware, different drivers, different operating systems will exhibit different roaming behaviors. And this is an example at a different LEA where there were so many devices, and they did happen to be iPads, in a particular hallway, that students could get IP addresses but couldn't effectively use the internet. As you can see here, there were something like 75 devices on the 5 gig radio and yeah, maybe two or three on the 2.4 gig radio. So what happens to throughput when you have uh, lots of devices on a single radio? Well, um, this is an interesting study done about two years ago uh, vendor neutral, where some folks decided to stress test iPads um, and access points. Well, actually, the access points using iPads. And you can read about the full write-up of the testing. I only pulled out the one graph to show throughput versus the number of access, or iPads on the access point. Um, and you can see that the throughput, when you have 16 to 20 devices on an access point radio pretty much uh, goes south. It just is not much left of the throughput when you get that many iPads on a radio. Um, on the right side, um, if you read the full write-up, there are, is a list of vendors you could see on the right side. Two of the devices tested with were Meraki devices, um, but it doesn't really matter where they're Meraki devices, Aerohive, Cisco, Pretty much all of them had died when you had that many devices on a radio. And this screen here shows something similar, although it was intended to show the difference in throughput that various mixes of 5 gigahertz clients will result in. The more clients, the slower the data rate per device. So what is an active device? One challenge we've encountered, whether looking at graphs in Meraki or in Cacti, is you folks sometimes have cart situations 
where there's a cart of Chromebooks, iPads, whatever, and these devices might not actually have users, nor any traffic. They may just be sitting there in the media center or the iPad garage. Um, this graph shows a garage type of situation, and unfortunately this was taken this summer, so it doesn't really show too much traffic anyhow. But here we see uh, there's about the same amount of traffic at midnight as at noon. The traffic is in a fairly flat horizontal line. So this is probably a garage situation with a cart of some sort of device. There weren't any actual people cruising the web at midnight. Whereas this was taken last week. Um, it's a five-day period, and we see peaks and valleys in the traffic. And no one is in the school at midnight. So this is more typical of the kind of traffic we would see if there were actual users instead of a cart situation. <clears throat> so what can affect the performance that you would see from access points beyond the mere number of users? Well, the number of radios. Are the access points dual band or single band? <clears throat> the number of antennas, too. When you look at the specifications for antennas, they will usually be written as number by number colon number. And broken down, the first number is the number of transmit antennas, the second number is the receive antennas, and then the last number after the colon is the number of spatial streams. So the larger the numbers, the better. A Meraki MR24 has, would be a 3 by 3 colon 3 radio, whereas a Meraki MR16 is a 2 by 2 colon 2 radio. So the Meraki MR24 uh, will provide better form, performance than the Meraki MR16. And as we saw previously, the applications running on the devices can make a difference in performance. An access point <clears throat> may have an effect on clients' roaming decisions by band steering, which we'll briefly discuss. Pretty much all the vendors support band steering nowadays, though their algorithms may differ. So we saw in an earlier screen where sometimes the drivers in the devices cause them to go to a particular radio. And here in our example, all the devices decided they wanted to be on the 2.4 gig radio. The way band steering works is when an access point sees this condition, it kind of lays low on the overloaded radio. So it might advertise the overloaded radio less frequently in the beacons. It may respond to connection requests less often on the more loaded radio. It will do things to make the less lighted, loaded radio look more attractive to users. And this is called band steering. Um, the setting is in Meraki and uh, it's under wireless access control. You choose the SSID and it's called traffic shaping. A little difficult to find. And if you set this, the Meraki's will try and encourage users to connect to the other radios. Well, it doesn't always work that way, though, because what happens if your user devices only have 2.4 gig radios? Well, they're obviously not going to jump over to the 5 gig radio if they can't. Or if the device drivers really, really prefer 5 gig, they may not go. Ideally, you'd hope to see them lay themselves out on the different radios. Okay, one should also be looking at the load on the interface. You should have for the 802.11n devices gigabit switch Ethernet interfaces and this will become more critical if you go to access points that are 802.11ac. Uh, you should plan on monitoring the uplink and we talked about the situation where you had a bunch of iPads doing two megabit high definition video, two radios per AP, 12 iPads per radio. You would end up with 48 megabit on the Ethernet side because all this traffic is coming down to the radios. If you had four access points on a switch, you would have four times 48 
traffic coming down from the internet or 196 meg entering the switch. Well, if your switch only has a 10100 interface going up to the internet, this is a problem. You're going to have a bottleneck on your switch. So the need for gigabit ethernet becomes clear. By the way, in Meraki, you can do throttling bandwidth limitations on a per SSID user basis, and this can affect the interface load. This is something you might want to consider for the guest network, at least. If you limit traffic, web browsing should still work, but students would find that it might take several days to download a movie or music. And for your guests, you're not necessarily ensuring that they can download music and movies and take advantage of your network. So you might want to consider this for the guest network. And the last thing we should probably look at monitoring would be the DHCP server that gives out IP addresses. Uh, you'd need to be sure that it's alive and know the number of addresses you have available in the scope and if you're running out of IP addresses. If you run out of IP addresses, you'll have all kinds of strange problems. So the Meraki Cloud talks to the access points using the following ports coming out of the firewall. These ports have already been opened by either ITS managing your firewall or your firewall administrator. We talked about up-down monitoring. Meraki does a pretty good job of that. Since it's communicating with the access points on those ports, if the Meraki cloud stops hearing from an access point, it figures the access point has died. And Meraki Cloud does allow you to send email alerts on occurrence of specific events, including access points being down. Here we see where we shut down a switch port, thus causing an access point to fail, and we got an email. You might also want to use the Gmail forwarding feature for Meraki alerts especially if it's a large site with different technicians at each school, or maybe there's a tech-savvy teacher or school secretary who can go have a look if we have a problem. Here the email initially comes to me, and you might want to set up a generic monitoring alias. Then depending on the text in the alert, the email gets copied to either MS Tech, who's in charge of rogues, or LM Tech, who's interested in down APs. So that was up down using Meraki Cloud, but what about the AP load? Can we monitor in that in Meraki? Yes, we can. Um, this is what was kind of frustrating for me about the Meraki interface, though. You have to go in on a per access point basis to look. Under wireless, access point, status, clients per AP, Ethernet up down, average amount of client data through the access point, and of course a channel utilization graph. And here's channel utilization, a little bit expanded under wireless access point status. We can see our channel utilization numbers, which would be basic interference, uh, what's going on in the channel. So one thing to keep in mind with channel utilization is the more access points you have in a particular area, the more interference you'll have. To illustrate this, here we have two vehicles with car sound systems installed pulling up to the same traffic light at the same intersection. Hopefully not one in my neighborhood. I think this was Miami, Florida. If both drivers have the sound turned to a normal volume, each driver can hear their own music okay. But if these drivers get into some sort of music war, with both of them making the sound increasingly louder, pretty soon neither driver can hear their own music due to interference from the other vehicle's sound system. Wireless is the same way with regard to interference. If you don't have a lot of access point coverage, having the power set to maximum may be okay because there's not a lot of car or access points close by. 
but if you have reasonably good coverage under wireless radio settings, you might want to set power to enable automatic power reduction. With the power reduction setting, the Meraki Cloud monitors which access points see each other's signals, and it reduces power accordingly to decrease interference. So if we wanted to monitor Meraki using cacti instead, what would we need? Well, we would need cacti. Cacti is Linux-based open source software. You can either install it yourself, we can provide instructions, or if you get us a PC, we can install and configure Cacti to begin with. My coworker Bradley Stevens previously did a webinar on Cacti as a virtual image, and this webinar is posted on our website. Since we'll be using Cacti in, or SMP in Cacti to monitor the Meraki equipment, we will be using MIBS. You don't have to know a lot about MIBs, but the Meraki MIB is the Meraki Cloud Controller MIB, which you can download from your Meraki Cloud. It's under Organization and Settings. So if you're thinking you want to monitor, for example, Meraki temperature by SNMP with Cacti or any other network management product, the Meraki MIB would need to include a variable for temperature to query, and it does not. While the Meraki MIB does have a variable for the number of users, users per AP, it does not have a variable for the number of users per radio, so that cannot be monitored. So we're going to assume that you have an installed cacti. I do. I have two of them, in fact, which we're going to see later. These are the steps we're going to go through to set up cacti to monitor Meraki. Looks like a lot, but it's, it's really not. It's pretty simple to set up. We do need to go into the Meraki cloud to tell it that Cacti will be polling the cloud. And this is under Organization SNMP. We need to know the Meraki host name. The Meraki cloud has a number of different nodes. Uh, the one for my home 8P is n26.meraki.com. Yours is probably something different. You will also need to meet, make note of the community string, um, the version of SNMP, which we have ours set for version 2C, um, and the port is always going to be the same in Rocky. It's going to be 16100. And we saw in the previous screen where the port that we need to use to communicate with Meraki is port UDP 16100. Um, you may need to have ITS or your network administrator open up UDP 16100 outbound because that needs to happen for Meraki, for your cacti to query Meraki. Okay, um, so we're done looking at Meraki Cloud. Now we're going to look at Cacti, and we're going to go live to our Cacti device. Um, and I clear our screen here, and we're going to test to be sure our firewall is set up properly, and that we can do an SNMP walk from our Cacti Linux box out to the cloud. And you can see here. We're, we're doing an SNMP walk, we're doing our version of SNMP, we're specifying our community string, which we wrote down from the Meraki cloud, we're telling it our node, the N26 and so on. We're just going to look at the system part of the MIB. Okay? And we got a response. So this is good. It's a good sign. All right. Um, so since our SNMP walk worked, now we need to download our Cacti template for Meraki. Um, since I wasn't wild about the Meraki cloud monitoring, I wrote a template for Cacti. Um, the Meraki template will tell Cacti what kind of animal Meraki is. So you would download this Meraki zip file, and um, we won't go into how to unzip a file. I think everybody knows how to unzip a file. 
But once the file is unzipped, you will have to transfer two XML files from your local box to the Cacti Linux box. And these are the two files. You can use FTP or Secure FTP to transfer those. And you can use SolarWinds Secure FTP Server. You can use FileZilla. You can install FTP on your Linux box that runs Cacti. You can set up the MacBook as a Secure FTP or FTP Server. Lots of options for getting those files over there. But once the files are there, you would locate your SNMP queries directory on the CentOS box. And we're going to go ahead and do this live. We're going to do the find command to find, well, actually, we're going to look for the SNMP queries directory there. Let's see, SNMP queries. OK. And we see that's where our SNMP query directory is on our Linux box. Now that we know where it is, we're going to copy the two files to that directory. OK? And uh, so we've got our two files there. And that's really the only command line involvement on the Linux box for, for folks who are maybe afraid of Linux. But now we need to import our Meraki host template. It was part of that zip file that we downloaded. And I'm showing that there, but we're going to go ahead and do this live on our Cacti box. So the way we get our host template here is we go into Import Templates. We're going to browse to our local machine where this is. And here's our Meraki host template. We're going to hit the Open button. And we're going to hit Import. And the fact that we got all green over on the left side is good. In other words, it worked. OK? So we have our host template here, um, which tells Cacti what kind of animal our device is that we're querying the Meraki Cloud. And uh, we're going to go ahead and add our Meraki Cloud to Cacti. And we go into Devices and add our Cloud. And we're going to call it My Meraki. And as you recall, our host name was n26.meraki.com. And we're going to use our host template that we just imported. It's called MERHT. We'll put monitor host in. We don't have to. Um, because when you think about it, if the Meraki cloud is down, probably the internet is down too. So we probably have more problems than just um, Meraki if the internet was down. But we're going to put our community string, the same as we used before, in here. And capital Q, this is case sensitive on our community string. OK, that looks good. And we're going to hit the Create button. OK, and it's taking it a minute. Oh, I think I hit the Create button. Uh, SMP here. OK, well, let's see. n26.meraki.com. Uh, let me be sure I've got my community string correct in here. Oh, I think I have a uh, 0 instead of an O. OK. Yeah, that's what's going on. OK, so we're going to hit Save. All right. And we see this worked. We see that we pretty much have the same information there as we did when we did our SNMP walk from the command line. We'll do our SNMP walk again. It looks familiar, OK? All right. So we have our Meraki cloud controller in our Cacti. And now we're going to go in and create graphs for the host. OK? And you can see where we have the ability to create a, oh, that's interesting. Um, oh, OK. It's refreshing. OK. <laughs> All right. Uh, data queries. OK. OK, we're waiting for it to refresh here. OK. Query. Do 
What's up with our query? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. I think it's going to work. All right. Create graphs for this host. I just wasn't patient enough here. Yeah. Gon says I'm not patient here. <laughs> All right, so at this point, we should be able to create uh, an interface query uh, for the first one. We'll hit the Create button. Okay. For our first one, and okay, for our second one, this would be a number of users. Just wasn't patient. If you had a series of access points, you know, dozens of access points, you would see them all listed here. Okay. I'm doing this across a VPN, through a VPN, through a VPN, so there's a little bit of a lag time. But we hit the Create Graphs for our button, and as a result, um, in about five minutes, we will have some graphs that we can look at for my home access point. Now, I can tell you, my home access point is pretty boring. Uh, there's not a lot going on with it. Um, all my users are on another access point at my house. So we're going to go in and look at a different version of Cacti where we're actually graphing uh, traffic for a charter school. We've had this going for a while, and we can go in and look at some graphs. And you can see where I have uh, the access points organized by the school building, elementary school, high school, middle school. And this is live traffic. Um, we've had this going for about a week. Um, and you can see where the traffic is being graphed. Every five minutes, a poll is being taken of the cloud in cacti. So why don't we pick one of the more interesting ones here, which is this uh, middle school um, Fort 43 access point. And as you can see by looking at the legend on the left side, this is the number of users we're looking at, number of clients, how at times we have had 80 users on this access point, which is a lot. So we can go in here and make it a little bit larger. And we see we're all of a sudden about uh, 12, 30 or so every day, um, we're getting hit by a bunch of users. And then this traffic suddenly stops at about 1.30 every day. Really not sure what's going on here. Uh, it's not the cafeteria, but for some reason or other, a lot of users are just um, attacking this access point, for better, lack of a better word, uh, around noon every day. Okay. It may be that it's students with iPhones. It may be, again, a cafeteria situation where you don't much care if the students have connectivity at this time of day. But if this were an instructional situation, it probably would matter. And let's go ahead and we'll look at the traffic to see when this happens. Is it actual traffic or is it just a cart of iPads being rolled into an area? So we're going to look at the traffic here. And we'll enlarge this to see. And is it actually traffic? Yes, it is actually traffic. And you can see because we're looking at the wired in traffic, the wired zero in traffic, which is this top green. And we're looking at the Wi-Fi zero out traffic, which is the red, and the Wi-Fi one out traffic, which is the blue up here, that this is downstream from the internet. And then this is further downstream from the access point out to the users. If we were to add the red and the blue, it would equal the green. And here we can see that because the 2.4 gig radio is Wi-Fi zero, it always is, that most of these users are on the 5 gig radio. We can tell this from the graph. OK? All right. Um, so it is good to be able to look at the graphs. They are useful because besides looking at the number of users, uh, we can determine the traffic there. Okay, so um, we will flip through some of these. We showed how to add the graphs for the device, the client and traffic graphs. We looked at the graphs on our existing cacti of the actual charter school. and. Uh, we talked about in versus out when we looked at the graphs. That can be confusing sometimes. When we talk about in versus out, in versus out is always from the perspective of the, the device. So you can think of yourself as the access point, and you have three interfaces. You have an Ethernet interface, which points towards the Internet, and you have two wireless interfaces that point towards the users. 
If you are the access point, wired zero into you is traffic from the internet coming towards you. Since the access point is connected to a switch using an ethernet cable, the traffic out from the switch traffic is equal to the traffic into the access point. Kind of makes sense. So here we see where our switch port 9 out traffic would be the same as the access point wired 0 in traffic. And of course the access point wired 0 out traffic would be the same as the switch port 9 in traffic. The designations are always from the point of view of the device. And the same for the wireless interfaces. The out traffic would always be leaving you and heading towards the users. As a general rule, the access point wireless out traffic will always be higher than the in traffic. And we saw in the graphs when there was a spike in the access point wired in traffic, there was also a spike in the wired in the wireless out traffic. This makes sense. Okay, so we talked about how we could query the Meraki cloud to see what was up with the access point. It's a very efficient way of doing things. All the information is in one place. But could we query the access points directly? Yes, we could. The MIB allows us, the um, proprietary MIB allows us to look at the number of bytes or the number of packets in and out of the access point interfaces. If we query the access points themselves, they do support querying the basic MIB2 variables. If we did that, that would be across the network, our internal network, on UDP port 161. And the downside is if you wanted to query each access point individually, you would have to list each access point in Cacti. If you'd like to do this, you would need to enable the querying in the Meraki cloud. And this is under Network General SNMP. So what could we query if we did query the MIB2 variables? Well, um, we would be able to look at bits, we would be able to look at bytes, discarded packets, non-unicast, and unicast. So a little more information than if we clear, queried the cloud. And um, got my slides mixed up, but this, this is how to query the access points, or how to set up the access points for querying in the Meraki cloud. Okay, so if we set up our access points for polling in the Meraki cloud, then we have to go into Cacti and add each access point individually by its local IP address. <clears throat> and we have to set up each access point for basic MIB2 polling of interfaces. And when we create our graphs, we tell it what we want to query. In other words, we're going to query the uh, in-out bytes versus the interface capacity of up to 10 items in there. So you see where we've set up monitoring and having Cacti query the Meraki cloud and the access points themselves, which are the black question marks we have listed here. But could we have Cacti monitor other things in our network? Well, we certainly could. Um, instead of having Cacti monitor each access, points access, access point interface internally, we could monitor the various ports on the switch using Cacti, including the switch uplink to the firewall. And here we're going to go into our existing 3750, which our access points are connected to, and we see how we have monitoring set up on our 3750. While our access point is connected to our gigabit port 109, and we also have a couple of Aerohive access points and, and some other things we're not even monitoring here, um, all of this gets aggregated on port gigabit 102, which goes up to our firewall. And you can see if we added all of our numbers, and actually there's some ones we, we're not even graphing here, our aggregate is more than the sum of these graphs here. Our aggregate, aggregate is larger there. 
not all switches support this kind of monitoring. The lower end switches do not. Okay. And last but not least, we're going to look at monitoring our DHCP server. This is where we have uh, Active Directory set up to provide DHCP. It's really easy to set up uh, in your Active Directory, the monitoring piece. So we didn't have to install the SNMP feature in our 2008 R2 server. It's kind of there in the code. It's just not enabled. We would tell it uh, through configuration who was allowed to query it and what the community string is. We would have to download a template for Cacti to query our, D or our Active Directory server. We would have to define our Active Directory server in Cacti and specify the community string. And one, we would have to specify the scope. I have three scopes in my Active Directory server. Only one of them is doing much of anything. So that's why I told Cacti to monitor that scope. And here we see our graphs. I use two different templates, kind of like the bottom graph uh, more than the uh, top graph. but. Um, that is how to monitor your DHCP server in Cacti. Okay, so we're almost done here, but I wanted to briefly touch on setting up a threshold in Cacti. Okay, and we're going to look at our live school, our charter school. Um, maybe where we want to, if this is an instructional situation, threshold on the number of users who are on this access point where we're hitting 80 at lunchtime. So we're going to go in here and choose create threshold. Create a new threshold, hit go. And our data source, there's only one we can choose, which is the device client count. We hit that and hit create. And then um, it shows us our historical graph. And uh, in here, we decide, well, at what point do we want to get a warning and, you know, saying we might have a problem? And at what, what point do we want to uh, actually uh, get an alert, which we definitely have a problem? So we're going to put in for our warning 70. For our high threshold, we're going to put in 80. And we can put in the breach duration. Um, in other words, if it's only for an hour and the hour's at lunchtime, hey, maybe it's not a problem, okay? Um, how often do we want to be pestered about this? So if we receive one alert, do we want to be pestered daily? Uh, if it's a PTA meeting going on in there and it only happens once in a while, uh, maybe it's not a problem. Maybe we want to be alerted about it once a month. We don't think this is something that's ever going to happen again, okay? So you can make decisions in there about how often uh, the parameters for alerting and then at the end, you can hit the Save button, which I'm not going to do here, but um, that is how to create a threshold. Now, we did go in and create an actual threshold for this school um, yesterday just to demonstrate what you would see in the logs if we had a threshold set up. And it's for a different access point, but we said if there are 20 users on an access point, we want a warning, and if, we, if there are 30, we want an alert. And you can see here from our looking at our log where it looks pretty darn red on this access point. And to set the alert this low, uh, you probably wouldn't want to do that. But I just wanted to have some traffic and some alerts for us to be able to look at. Okay, um, Since we only have one access point in our network, uh, which we created, okay. Um, for example, our home access point, it would be overkill to, pre, to put this on a tree, but we could go in and do that. We go in here, choose an action, place on a tree, and then this allows me to create kind of a custom look in Cacti to decide what I want to have going on and how I want to look at this. And I can put it on Cisco. I'd probably put it on Meraki. Okay, hit Meraki, hit continue. Next time I went to look, I would see where my access point or my cloud would be on the graph tree in there. Okay. Um, I, I think about the only thing I haven't covered 
and this is something we're probably going to do in a future webinar, is configuring Cacti so that there could be automation, automated emails about error conditions. You saw where when we set up a threshold, we were able to look at that information in the log in Cacti, but if you're not sitting there looking at the log on your desk or at the end of the day or once a week, you may not see what's going on. Cacti can send emails out. You can send emails to like uh, your phone. You can send text messages to your phone uh, using Cacti. So this is probably something we're going to cover in a future webinar. Um, so we will be posting this webinar online within the next few days. And we will take questions from the audience at this point, if there are any. You were going to stop recording. Okay. Okay. Well, wait a minute. Should I do the last screen? Let me bring it up. Okay. Uh, let's see. We'll go ahead and uh, zip through these. And the threshold, moving to the tree. And um, we will have the webinar posted online in the next few days. Uh, this is the link. And uh, feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions at all about wireless monitoring. Thank you.